Kirkar, the organizing secretary of the conference and a professor of cardiology at the KEM hospital. Today, we have in our studio a pioneer in the field of alcohol septal ablation for hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. We have with us one of the international faculties of the conference, Professor Dr. Hubert Segevis from Frankfurt, Schweinfurt, fr close to Frankfurt, from the Leopoldina Hospital. That's correct? So, welcome to Mumbai, welcome, Amchi Mumbai. Papula. Welcome, Fafula. Thank you for the invitation. Yes. And we know that uh, we both stood in the CAS lab years ago to uh, start with you the program of subtle ablation in KAM. So, Mumbai, I also would give you a German welcome if you like it. Yeah, and you okay. tell me if is it good. The German welcome is Herzlich Willkommen in Unsere Mumbai. Yeah. Is that good? Yeah, very good. Unfortunately, I cannot answer in Hindi. <laughs> oh, lovely. <laughs> so by the time Professor Hubert Sigwis lives from here, we'll give him a few things, tips about Hindi. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Aapka swagat hai Mumbai mein. Oh, that's difficult. That's difficult. <laughs> that's difficult. Anyway, let's get on with the business. So we are here, Professor Hubert Sigwis, to discuss the nuances of alcohol septal ablation. As yes. you, what I would like to tell you is that we, uh, uh, most international cardiologists also are today shunning away from alcohol septal ablation, mainly because of the risks which are, so to say, overplayed. So what do you have to say about the risk of septal ablation? Um, the risk of septal ablation in general is uh, that you can create... Um uh, complete heart block in about 10% after the procedure. But the main risk is to that you may produce complications you want to avoid. That means especially infarction in areas you don't want to be infarcted. As you know, alcoholceptal ablation means you create a septal infarction, a therapeutic septal infarction in the second part of the septum that um, is part of the building of the obstruction. And once you overcome this region, you can create an infarction, especially in papillary muscles, it's very dangerous. And there are some tricks or some specialties to avoid these complications. So what you want to say is echo guidance is absolutely mandatory. Yes. Am I right? Yes. Oh, okay. That is what we want to say. And when we started it in 1996, we had an echo on every of our first 20 patients on the intensive care unit the hours after the intervention. And then we saw in one patient that the alcohol depot was too far, distal or apical in the septum. And then we thought, how can we predict the location of the alcohol? Uh, and then we had the idea to inject at that time Levovis, a contrast agent in order to avoid these mis So ablations. taking it further on the contrast agent, today Levovist is not available. So how do you substitute for Levovist? Okay, this, is, uh, this was a problem in the uh, early uh, 2010 years when we heard that uh, sharing uh, would stop the production. And we, we tested every contrast agent that was available at that time and then we had the idea to use gelafondine, a colloid, and uh, the important thing is that you have for, to agitate. For viewers, let me say, you mean gelafuskin? Yes. That, that's correct. Yes. That's exactly yes. what we use too. Yeah. yeah. And the trick is you have to uh, take it from the refrigerator and you have to agitate it. And once you have done it, it gives a very good contrast. So does it retain as well? Yes, yes. it retains. So it is a good substitute yes. and a cheaper substitute and for cheap. level, level waste. And very cheaper. relevant in our yeah. country. Yes, okay. yeah, yeah. Yes, correct. That's very good. So to go on with it, now the real question, when it, a big question in other words, is that do you go by the size of the septal artery or do you go by the septal thickness in terms of how much would you inject? 
uh, I go by the septal sickness. The septal Which is very important yeah. for our viewers. Yeah, the septal artery sickness does not play a role. The septal muscle sickness plays a role. And we inject about one cc per centimeter septal thickness. So would you attempt it also with septal thickness more than 30 millimeters? This is a very difficult question and you have to answer this question very individualized to the patient. And if you have a lot of scar in MRI in these patients, um, there is no good chance that you create a good result. And then you should discuss it with the patient. And if the patient says, okay, we try, and I've done patients with more than 30 millimeters, 30 millimeter septal sickness and it works and there are some patients it didn't work but it, it's very individualized so once you've injected alcohol so like for instance in the more than 30 millimeter septal thickness patient you tell me one thing is that what are his chances of being able to say he fails about being able to go to the surgery afterwards does the surgeon ever complain about what you've done in there um, surgeons always complain if interventionalist does something. So okay, that that's, you, a, that you have, that's <laughs> a valid point. That you have to expect. But uh, there is no additional risk uh, unless you created a right bundle branch block. Then you have a high chance after surgery that you uh, have a total heart block because surgery results more or less in, uh, in 50, 60 percent in a left bundle branch block. So if you have a pre-existing right bundle branch block, you may expect that the patient is patient dependent afterwards. So, so having said that, what percentage of patients do get right bundle branch block in the lab? And say there is a right bundle branch block that's occurred, okay? Yeah. If there is a right bundle branch that has occurred, then would you stop further from alcohol? How do you weigh that decision about the end point? No, Would you strictly yet go by the alcohol depot that's created on... I go by the alcohol depot. It, there are analyzes that uh, you create a right bundle branch block in about 40 to 50 percent of the patients. And patients with a right bundle branch block after a procedure have the best results. Oh, okay. Uh, have the best results. Okay. So, so right bundle branch block occurring during alcohol septal ablation is not a contraindication to go further with your alcohol injections. So having said that, having said that, what would you do if you do get a CHB on table and you haven't really injected much alcohol? Um, I go further because you have only one chance to ablate this branch and the area that is supplied by this branch. So if I have a total heart block during alcohol injection, I go on for injection and whatever happens, it's the same with the other patients who develop a heart block after the procedure. At the end, 10% require a pacemaker. And it's not dependent whether the patient gets a heart block immediately when you inject the alcohol or whether he develops a heart block afterwards. Oh, okay. So which means occurrence of complete heart block will not deter you from injecting more alcohol. How about coming again? Like, for instance, the success of the procedure could be determined later on. You have that typical triphasic response. Oh, yeah. You do get the gradients coming down later on. The pain? Uh, yeah. Uh, so what about that? Meaning you inject, you come back, if he's not succeeded, you can always do it again. There, you don't believe in that? Yeah, that it depends what is your primary strategy. My primary strategy is to inject one uh, alcohol in one septal branch per session. And uh, then wait because we know that there is a kind of remodeling process after the alcohol injection. That means that you have to have a redo in about 15 to 17 percent of the patients. But this is not a failure because you also see that there are a lot of patients that have a good result after three months, after six months with this small area of necrosis. And to have a smallest area of necrosis to reduce the gradient, that is my aim. And this includes 
that you have some redos. There, I know other people who inject more alcohol in more than one branch, but they have higher complication rates. And our complication rates, I told you we analyzed our complete data of Schweinfurt, our complication rates, mortality is 0.2%. And this is very low, from my point of view, for an interventional procedure. Oh, yes, indeed. That is why you are here, Professor. Yeah. <laughs> and we don't l lose, we didn't have lost any patient on the table. The complications were afterwards. These are the dangerous, the first two or three days are the dangerous phases. Uh, because uh, they develop a gradient after three days again, because there is edema, and then it's the question, can everybody in the hospital manage this situation? Okay. So what happens, you never go by gradients no. on table? No. So gradients may drop, may not drop. Is there any minimum amount of alcohol that you would necessarily inject? Yes. Or if you get a response with just, say, half a ml, uh, will you stop or will no. you still? No, in, you wouldn't. In the, in, the, in the late 90s, there were some studies uh, to have uh, less alcohol than 1 cc per centimeter. And these results were not good. Uh, the hemodynamic results for a long term were not good. And once you have injected 0.5 cc of alcohol in a branch, the branch is occluded. You, cannot do, you can't do anything more in this branch. And if this is a branch, you have lost it and for treatment. So you have to go for 1 cc per centimeter septal sickness, whatever okay. happens in between. Oh, okay. So at least 1.5 ml of alcohol yes, yes. would be in yes. there, correct? There's also a question, how thin can a septum be in order to make a septal ablation? We have treated not few patients with 15 uh, millimeter septal sickness. And if you do not go behind 1.5 cc of alcohol in these patients, you don't have any problems. We never had a VSD. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you've never report. You never have had a ventricular. No, septal we never defect. had a VSD. I know about some VSDs, but analyzing these cases, it said the alcohol was in the wrong place. Uh -huh. So and then these patients got a VSD. So what about the other complication, ventricular tachyarrhythmia? Um, in the ICU afterwards, ventricular tachyarrhythmias, have you ever experienced that? And we have it in how one. do you go about them? Yeah, we have it in one, but this was a dislocation of the temporary pacemaker. Oh, is that and right? This was artificial, but you have to think about it, but it's not due to the infarction. From this standpoint of view, it's not dangerous. And you may know, I'm sure you know, that in the late 80s, uh, alcohol injection in septal branches was introduced to treat uh, ventricular tachycardia originating from the septum. And so alcohol can reduce uh, the number of ventricular tachycardia. And you also know that there is another type of scar. It's not this typical uh, scar uh, um, coming from coronary artery disease. It's a sharp bounded scar after septal ablation. And therefore, you do not have the overlap. So it is overplayed, you think, the yeah, thing yeah. about ventricular tachyarrhythmias? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's good. Now, having said that, uh, would you offer it to the young as well? This is also a question. Um, uh, because that's, to, like a, that's like a, a contraindication. You have to, do, uh, to decide individualized. The results in younger patients are not worse. Um, so. And we have, I told you, we have now our long-term follow-up results up to 17 years. And even in the Bad Oeynhausen cohort, more than 20 years. And we have no increased risk. We have also reduced risk of dying. So our overall uh, survival free of cardiovascular events, um, analyzed by kaplan Meyer after 15 years, is 0.92. Oh, wow. So it is so, comparable to surgical results. Yes, comparable to surgical results. Um, we cannot state that uh, we can reduce the risk of dying. But if you compare it with uh, normal people, normal population, 
the risk is not increased, even in this uh, people in this disease. Oh, that's excellent. So, if and when you publish these results, do you think they will make a change in the guidelines? I think there is a change in the guidelines, but one word of caution. Septal ablation is not simple PCI. And sometimes, exactly. and sometimes you see that people who are not very familiar with the disease and with the problems of the treatment, they do septal ablation because they think it's very easy. First, a, a, a guide wire, then a, a balloon, and then alcohol. This is not the case. You must know, you must have an idea of the disease. And then it's, you have the good results. And with these results, we have a change of guidelines. Oh, okay. So that's a point well taken. So, so there is a good long-term follow-up. The scar business. Now, what do you tell? What do you have to say about the scar caused by the septal myomectomy versus the scar caused by alcohol septal ablation? Do you have anything on that? To s we don't have. Uh, there is a scar also after septal myomectomy. Uh, whatever. There's no surgery without any scar. Also, the surgeon states that there is no scar, but you see a scar. If you analyze these patients after death and they had myectomy before, you see some type of scar. It's a different scar, but there is a scar. But nevertheless, myectomy is a very good option. But on the other hand, it's not so easy. And you don't find uh, so very uh, um, uh, many surgeons that can do a perfect septal myectomy. That is the other point. So, in both treatment options, you must have experts. So, you said that in our country also, we do not have, or for that matter, that's a story world over. We do not have those kind of surgeons that Mayo Clinic has or Cleveland yeah. Clinic has, yeah. or for that matter, Sean Duber, yeah. the famous surgeon with you in, in Germany. In yeah. Germany. So, the, which is very much here. So, you think alcohol septal ablation is a procedure that's extremely important and it changes the natural history of this disease from which most of us, can, even cardiologists want to stay away from decision making about hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. So, yeah. they have a good prognosis. From the scientific standpoint of view, you need controlled trials. But from the clinical observation, uh, I think septal ablation changes the natural history of the disease. So and very important take-home message that. Yeah. We have, I, I personally have in Germany performed um, more than 1,500 septal ablation. And we have more or less a complete follow-up in these patients. And we do not harm the patients. 1,500, yeah. that's in an Germany. astounding number. Yeah. And, um, so we do not harm the patient. So, and therefore, I believe that we change the natural history oh, of that's, the disease. That's excellent. So from viewer's point of view today, I hope you have been educated in the business of the final nuances of alcohol septal ablation for hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Now let us go beyond alcohol septal ablation. A person who's done the maximum number of alcohol septal ablations probably in the world. What do you do beyond alcohol septal ablation in interventional cardiology? Let's move out of cardiology. And what do you, what do, you do beyond cardiology? Beyond cardiology, of course, I have uh, many interests. First of all, it's my family. You know, we have two children. And uh, we travel a lot. So oh, I, I, I you love to travel. Yeah, I like to travel. I combine meetings like this to uh, get to know the countries we go to, and um, I'm a little bit, a little bit of music business. We support uh, young musicians uh, so that they can produce uh, music, their music, and uh, hopefully sell them. And uh, we support musicians uh, by sponsoring concerts. Oh, lovely. Uh, this is a uh, very important point. And um, I don't know whether cardiologists like to hear it. I drive motorbike. And, uh, <laughs> and you're well protected with uh, headgears and all that? Always well protected, unless we drive in the US. So we have this, uh, in the US, the traffic is not that 
not that like oh, in Europe. So you drive your motorbikes on the autobahns of Germany and how fast do you go on your motorbikes? Uh, and normally we, we try to avoid uh, the um, motorways uh, because the curves are better in the mountains. Um, once, I tell you, once I tried to be higher than 200 kilometers per hour. And there was no traffic. But it was fun. <laughs> it was fun? Oh, lovely. So, like, you are an interventional person even outside of your field of cardiology, right? Yeah. You yeah. have that kick of an interventionist. Yeah. I, I was lucky. I was very young in the uh, early 80s um, to get involved in interventional cardiology. I did my first PCI in 1985. Wow, so and, it's like 30 um, years you know that ago. I was in Bad Oeynhausen before, you have been in Germany too. Yes. And uh, at that time we had uh, a high number uh, of uh, PCIs and we, I introduced uh, more or less every new tool till the early 2000s uh, that came on the market. And then I know that many tools came and more tools went. Oh, so the only thing that stayed from my point of view is the balloon, the stand and the roll up later uh, to, to do something like that. I have seen many, many things. I also introduced that it's um, in Germany with my colleague mitral valvuloplasty for mitral stenosis. Oh, so and there is... um, we had the chance that Professor Inouye uh, visited us as the first clinic in Europe and all the other things. Unfortunately, I'm, I worked in a, in a community hospital and I had, did not have the facility to go further with my clip and Tavis. I know about it, but I didn't personally do it. But okay, devices but I, I think it. now you should look at life beyond cardiology yeah. and with your love to travel, I think you can come back to Mumbai again and be outside of this conference area and experience the other things that people can do in Mumbai. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Professor Sikibis. Okay. We had a you. good time. Yeah. Thank you thank so you. much thank and you. safe travels. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.